Hey there, entrepreneur. Welcome, welcome, welcome to today's show. I am so excited to be joined by Susie DeVille today. She is a speaker, author, and founder and CEO of the Innovation and Creativity Institute, which is a coaching firm connecting entrepreneurs and business leaders to their innate capabilities, guiding them to lead from a place of creative confidence, which I absolutely adore, breaking the status quo and creating a wildly innovative methodology to build successful businesses. Susie is a sought after enterprise expert. She is known for creating rebels out of entrepreneurs and leaders who yield lighter workloads and higher profits, which isn't that the dream, everybody. Her book, Buoyant, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Becoming Wildly Successful, Creative, and Free is available wherever books are sold. And I suggest you go find it. Susie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to jump in because you've got some you've got some extremely valuable stuff to share with us. So take us back, take us through a little bit of your entrepreneurial journey, some adversity maybe you face, something like that. So jump in. Sure. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. So I got my training early <laughs> and often. Um, my dad had a retail store here in a in the resort town that I grew up in. And so I started working in his business when I was 12 years old and learned all of the aspects of business um, from the retail perspective from him. Um, then went off to college, um, then moved to uh, Boston thought I was going to be in the finance world, then a little something called um, October of 1987 happened, which was Black Monday. And yeah. I thought, hmm, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm going to do something else. So I got into publishing and then from there um, lived in um, London for a couple of years working for HarperCollins, moved back mm -hmm. to the mountains in North Carolina, which is where I am now and um, launched into uh, the world of nonprofit leadership. So founded a couple of nonprofits, which was enormously gratifying. And um, then got into the world of real estate. Um, and I have my um, real estate license still, still an active real estate broker. Just started a new real estate company. Didn't think I was going to do that again. I had one um, started um, in 2011, sold it very successfully in 2018. And I knew I was going to continue to stay in real estate, but um, didn't think I was going to start a new company again. But um, the people who bought my company decided to downsize and simplify. So I decided, well, okay, back in real estate ownership right. again. Um, but along the way, um, in 2005, I went back to get my master's degree in entrepreneurship. And it was during that time that I was introduced to the world of innovation and creativity via a design firm in Palo Alto called IDEO. That set me on this path of learning everything I could about innovation and creativity and um, became a coach, an uh, entrepreneur coach slash life coach um, around the same time and then launched the Innovation and Creativity Institute and began folding in everything that I was learning from the research that I was doing, which continues to this day. I am completely addicted <laughs> to research. Um, kept doing that and then ultimately um, took everything that I learned from my own time in the fire, which I'll talk about in a second, as well as what I was learning from my coach, my um, fellow coaches and my clients and put all of that into my book, which you referenced in the introduction. But there was a moment that launched me into what I lovingly refer to as my nuclear winter period, <laughs> which was the crash of the financial markets. And at the time, of course, I was in real estate. My then husband was in um, construction. Okay. So everything, of course, financially for us turned to vapor. Um, and along with that, um, the marriage, uh, we lost our house, my health declined, um, because of stress. And um, so everything literally imploded in my life. And so as I was sitting there sort of amongst the wreckage <laughs> of what was my life, I sort of had my Scarlett O'Hara moment and said, you know, as God is my witness, if I get out of this mess that I'm in, um, which also included $250,000 worth of debt. Wow. Um, if I get out of this giant mess that I'm in, 
then I promise I'm going to come back and I'm going to teach people how to similarly extricate themselves from whatever situation that they're in. It could be financial, it could be physical health, it could be um, burnout, it could be overwhelm, it could be frustration with inability to contact and connect with your market. Whatever it is, whatever has you by the tail, um, I have this incredible passion to pull the thorns out of entrepreneur's paws um, so that you can do the work that you came here to do from a place of clarity and confidence Mm -hmm. and calm. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful because that's the thing is we do, we get stuck in these little ruts, right? And I think, so what did you use to kind of get yourself through that? Just that kind of, I love how you referred to it as a Scarlett O'Hara moment. Um, <laughs> if, if you do not know what that is and you are listening to this podcast, go Google it, please. Um, Cause it's a, it's a great moment. Um, so what did you, what do you think was your greatest asset when you were kind of moving through that period? Well, it turned out to be something that I, I discovered along this path of, of research that I was doing that was connected to innovation and creativity, which was absolutely counter to everything that I have been taught through culture my entire life. Yeah. So the messaging that I had been given through all of the um, business lore my entire life was you buckle down, you roll up your sleeves, um, you work like a maniac and, um, you can sleep when you're dead, (laughs) uh, but you need more discipline and more productivity if you're going to dig yourself out of this hole. Yeah. And I actually tried that (laughs) because I didn't know what else to do. (laughs) Right. And I realized that I was just digging myself into a bigger, um, a bigger state of depletion. My anxiety was, off the charts. Um, I went into a pitch meeting, which I write about in the book, and I had the most brilliant, beautiful solution for this board that needed to have a clever and creative solution to a challenge that they had. And I had it all mapped out, but my energy was so wonky and off that they couldn't see, they couldn't resonate with the message. They couldn't resonate with the pitch because I was all out of whack. So what I learned was that I needed to get back in touch with and heal my authentic self. And in order to do that, I had to do um, what Paulo Coelho says, which is I had to inspire myself, which is literally breathing in beauty art, nature, doing things that I love to do, being with people I love and letting that top off the tank of my energy and my willingness to then start to look at the world and look at solutions and access my intuition and my imagination and my problem solving ability in a very different way. So it wasn't about white knuckling my way forward to success or climbing out of the pit of despair that I was in through more efforting and more work, which is my go-to thing. Even though I've been doing this now a different way for 14 years, I, that's still, I still believe in the back of my mind. So I know when I tell my clients this and people who are listening um, to this interview now, that's what you're saying can't be true. How is it that doing things that we love and connecting with our true self on a fulcrum of inspired creativity, how is that going to be the key to our success? That sounds loopy. It sounds yeah. magical thinking like, um, so I discovered this, um, incredible series of, uh, powerful levers that I call the five M's mm-hmm. and they're going to be familiar to everyone, but the way that I suggest that people use them in their lives is probably pretty different. Yeah. So let me run through what the five M's five M's are, and then I'll tell you what each uh, mean sure. and how to do them easily. 
So <clears throat> the first is morning pages, which is simply journaling. And that's the brainchild of author Julia Cameron from The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. um, that is our opportunity to get everything that's swimming around in our head out onto paper so that we can actually free ourselves from it and begin to hear ourselves think again. One of the greatest um, epiphanies that I have had, and I have this literally every single morning when I do journaling, is the incredible power that writing down your whiny, <laughs> crazy thoughts and your celebratory thoughts right. and your things that you're excited about. But getting that out and getting some distance is so vital to being able to turn your entire focus into a different direction from mm -hmm. being on defense to being on intentional offense. Yeah. Um, so that's the first one. The next one is movement. And this can be anything um, if you want to do chair exercises or if you want to go out on a hike or do yoga or Pilates, but moving the body. And I know we all have been told this a zillion times, um, but when we get out and, and, and have some time in fresh air, especially and move our bodies, there is a connection to ourself that is unique and it is calming on our entire systems. And there's not um, an equivalent. There are lots of things that do those same things for us, but not in the exact same way that movement does for us. Right. Um, the next is meditation. And then I always get the howls of resistance from my oh, I love meditation. I bring it up. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be sophisticated, doesn't have to be complicated, doesn't have to be 30 minutes. It can be five minutes in a room of quiet to restore, again, to restore your, your sense of self, restore your connection to yourself. Um, the next is moments of inspired learning. And I keep a book of poetry as well as short stories and some nonfiction books next to my bed. And I will just reach in and dip in for just a few minutes. Yeah. Or if I'm out on a walk, I'll just play um, some poetry that is either narrated by Mary Oliver or David White or John O'Donohue. Um, and it could just be a couple of minutes and it's so powerful to have that time and then just let their words just kind of linger around you as you're tromping through the woods. <laughs> the last M is making something. And this is the one that everybody really fights me on, really resists because we're taught that we're not creative, that we're not artists. And that has such a strange negative connotation for us in a lot of ways. I was absolutely in this camp. I knew I had creative tendencies, but I would never have called myself an artist. Never in a million years. Mm -hmm. Even though I was definitely a writer and did lots of creative things. I was like, oh no, no, I'm not not because artist to me was someone who could look at an object or a scene and replicate it through sketch or painting. Yeah. That was artist to me. Yeah. That tiny, narrow, silly little definition. Yeah. And I think we all tend to kind of fall into that trap. So one of the beautiful things about moving your hands for about five minutes, and it doesn't have to be anything complicated. You can doodle, you can sketch something that's literally sitting on your desk for three minutes. You can um, play around and paint if you want to go a little bit um, fancy. You can collage. Um, you can make something in the kitchen, whatever it is. This is the fast train <laughs> to truly re reconnecting with our agency. The thing that so many of us over the last few years have lost 
through experiencing the pandemic and then the sort of after effects of all of that. Mm -hmm. So you're tapping into your creativity and the five M's is your path to self-trust and out of self-doubt and then sort of back at the helm of your own life yeah. where you're making powerful intentional choices for yourself and for your business and connecting with your market in ways that you never dreamed possible. Yeah. I mean, I think what, everything that you're saying requires you to slow down, right? Yes. On some levels, right? Which I think that's at least where I get the biggest resistance from clients sometimes, right? Is that, you know, when I've resisted myself, I'm going to put myself in that same bucket too, as I'm sure you've had kind of periods where you've resisted as well. But every it's, day, yeah, exactly. I said <laughs> periods. It's like a way of being sometimes. Um, <laughs> It's living, you know, just living in that constant kind of push and pull. But, you know, as I tell people sometimes, sometimes you really have to fight for it. Sometimes, you know, you do have to kind of, when the world is swirling around you, claw yourself back to that creativity. Because to your point, that is what kind of roots you in your innate humanity, in your innate authentic self, you know, different things like that. And I, I love how you said that, you know, this, this definition of being an artist, right? So I have an arts background as well. And it's, it's funny is that people in the business world, they're like, oh, an artist, like they expect you to come in like a crazy hippie, like <laughs> doing dances <laughs> around a fire or something. And I'm like, no, no. Like I think, you know, I view artists as, you know, if you can code, that's art. If you can, you know, there's yes. so many different versions of just this an ability to create, which, you know, therefore makes you creative period. Right. Absolutely. And what's so interesting, and I do this exercise with folks, um, whether they're C-suite executives or entrepreneurs right. or nonprofit leaders, I, I walk people through two different exercises. The first one is to um, do a blind drawing um, in, in a minute. Wow. So they're not allowed to look, they look at the object, um, but they're not allowed to look at their paper while they're drawing it. Oh, wow. So that does a couple of things. Number one, for all of us control freaks, can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> yes, hallelujah. Uh, because <laughs> that to me is the most terrifying thing in the world. Like is, I want to look at this because so I, I want it to be pretty. I yeah, want it to exactly. be good. I want it yeah. to look right. But that of course is not the point. This is the first lesson of sort of tapping into your creativity the end result of what you make is not the point. Right. We want it to be the point. Um, and we want, and we're attached to how good it looks. But um, as Linda Berry says, that's none of your business. Um, she's an <laughs> author and an artist, and that's none of your business. What is your business is your experience of the transformation of what's happening to you yeah. when you're making something, when you're doing the sketch. So it's a tricky little thing that I like to do because you can't have any compare and despair, right. especially if you're in a group because nobody got to look. <laughs> right. You even the playing field. Yeah. You, it's, and, and, you know, so, and, and it's kind of silly and, but, but people start to feel what I love to watch in people. And I preface the exercise because I want people to be tuned into what's going on inside of their body when they first look at the thing and the mind starts to label and bark, lack and attack fears that mm -hmm. say things like, well, okay, let's say I put a, a vase of flowers on the table. Yeah. The brain starts saying, oh gosh, you're going to have to figure out perspective and shadows and petals. Can you draw a petal? Oh my God, you can't draw a petal. Can you draw a leaf? No, you can't. So that's the first 60 to 90 seconds of the brain just going. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But this happens to us as entrepreneurs on the reg on a regular basis yes, as well. It's just a different thing. So what's lovely is that if you hang in there with that vase of flowers or whatever it is, there is this moment when you cross that threshold, when you go into that portal, when you kind of actually sort of um, meld in, in, in a meditative way with the thing that you're drawing. And then the shoulders drop 
And then there's kind of a sense of, oh, I think I can do this. Yeah. I'm no longer so stressed out. I'm no longer so focused on what it's going to look like. And that to me is the point. Right. Because that builds in us this beautiful sort of um, series of, of neural highways of resistance, anxiety, fear, hanging in there, keeping going. And then pushing through and, and entering into the the portal yeah. of of joy and and um, no more resistance. So if we can tolerate an average of sixty to ninety seconds of discomfort, whether we're looking at the vase of flowers and trying to sketch it, or we're sweating bullets over how to write the sales copy for the new website, if we hang in there and stay with it, the, the beautiful result is that we do go into this portal. We do go into this opportunity to tap into words we didn't know we had, for example, or messaging that has felt elusive to us, or design and color ideas that are now seeming to come out of the, the, the blue, but they're not coming out of the blue, they're coming out of us. Yeah. And it's all in there. But the trick is we have to do what I call archaeology of the self to just access it. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's such a great point is that I think people think fear that it's lost. Like, and it's not this, this level that you're describing is not lost. It's just buried. You know, I love that archaeology of self, you know, phrase, because I think, you know, you don't see it in children, but after so many years of getting older, it's layer upon layer upon layer just kind of gets dropped onto that. And I think at some point in time, like um, creativity is labeled innovation, right? <laughs> when you get older for some reason, right? Like, right. Cause all God sudden, forbid. Like, a brain. You can't be creative, <laughs> but you can be innovative, you know, like, well, they're, but they're in the same bucket. They're in the same it bucket. It is. And, and but, yeah. but the secret, but creativity has this um, um, connotation of glue sticks yes. and yeah. people who are retired, who have tons of yeah. time, <laughs> crafty people. Yeah. Um, and it has nothing to do with, you know, us serious, hard charging entrepreneurs, you know, right. are you kidding me? Um, so, and I totally get that because honestly, I would have fallen into, I would have stayed in that mindset. I didn't, I yeah. didn't have to fall into it. I was already in it. Yeah. Um, which was part of the reason, frankly, I got into the mess that I was in was yeah. that I was so disconnected from my true self. I was on the ultimate gerbil wheel doing, doing deals, doing real estate deals. It was like, you know, negotiating this one, putting that one under contract, getting yeah. that one through due diligence, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I was just, uh, I had, um, the other killer was I didn't have any boundaries. So any client who wanted to access me could at any hour of the day or night. Yeah. Um, I was completely exhausted. I, I had stopped doing, here's the other word of caution. I had stopped doing the things that I loved to do. Mm -hmm. And I even got to the point where I kind of forgot the things that I love to do, yeah. things that I did for, you know, the majority of my life that I love to do that yeah. filled me up. Um, I stopped doing because I was too busy. Right. So one of the quickest and most fun paths back to tapping into ourselves and digging through these strata of sediment <laughs> is, um, is to think back, okay, what did I love to do that I haven't really done in the last three, four, five plus years Yeah, and start to reintroduce that back into your life and reconnect with that because there was something about that that gave you a sense of um, freedom and a sense of expression, most mm -hmm. likely, that will fill you again with that same sense of empowerment once you start to do it again. And it's probably also connected with a community of people yeah. that you might've lost touch with as well. Yeah. I mean, it's that, it's that starting, right? Because like you said, like when you're, 
when you get in that um, forward motion where you just kind of shut those things down, it's like you don't you don't realize you're missing it anymore, right? Because you're you've normalized the level of chaos and you've normalized the yes. hustle grind and all of that stuff. So you know, taking time to you know, I'm a big theater person, taking time to go see a show seems frivolous. However, like you forget what you feel like after it happens. And it's, I think a lot of people, if you're listening to this, you know, I think it's that starting point. It's that like dipping your toe back into those, those things that you loved is probably kind of the hardest part because you almost have to, you almost need that social proof that it's worth of your worthy of your time or something. Oh my gosh. That is so well said. And so true because we all do it. And Mm -hmm. we, I think let's talk about the word frivolous for a second, yeah, because yeah. those of us who believe that we can overachieve our way out of burnout, look at <laughs> frivolousness as the ultimate sin in, yes. in a way, right? Because, yeah. because you just, you're not going to fritter away your, your time and your attention and doing this, whatever stuff, um, that may, you know, that these soft sort of like in the, the same bucket of soft skills. Um, and I would say a fun thing to do. So let's say you, you believe that journaling every morning may have merit and you're saying, okay, Susie, I'm going to try that. So what am I, what am I going to write about? The very first thing you can do is write about write a list of everything you think is frivolous. And I'm going to, I bet you um, an entire vacation in Paris that (laughs) you will see that that list is your soul howling out for your attention to please wake up and to please get back in touch with those things. Because I can tell you the more frivolous things that I do, and this is not something, even though I have, again, I have done this for over a decade. I have to literally train myself to go against the grain of myself, of that belief. Yeah. And every single time I do it, I, I enjoyed this this morning as a matter of fact, <laughs> I thought, oh, I don't have really, cause you know, I'm still trying to catch up from the holiday stuff and I'm looking at the inbox, which is just like growing weeds. <laughs> and I'm thinking, um, I don't really have time to do this series of things, you know, that's going to probably take about 45 minutes to an hour that I know that it would be super fun and, and I'm rewarding for me. And I just said, okay, this is exactly my sign that I need to do it because the second I start thinking that way, I know I'm going into the wrong, the wrong behind the wrong door. Yeah. And, um, out on, I saw I was out on a hike and had the most incredible creative breakthrough. Whereas for the last six days, I have been chasing an idea and couldn't figure it out. Couldn't put the pieces together and out on a walk. And I had my journal and it just was like, bloop, yep, that's silver platter. And yep. I was like, okay. <laughs> so that's the reward that comes consistently when we are doing those quote unquote frivolous things, it powers our businesses in ways that we can't imagine that we can't believe is true. (laughs) And, um, it powers our own, um, joy and our own desire to serve and connect with the people who were so desiring of serving and, um, taking, taking care of. Wow. Yeah. I just, what you just described is, you know, it's again, like we've mentioned lots of times on this show, it's why your ideas come in the shower. It's why, you know, it's, it's why when you do have that downtime, I love that example you gave of being on that hike and then bam, it hits you. It's like it needed, it needed the space to come in. And if, when your brain is just go, 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 there's no room for any innovation, any creativity to actually permeate through and make an impact which to your point earlier, you know, everyone thinks the harder you push, the more likely it is to come. And it's actually the complete opposite. So, you know, that's great. And the more lost we're willing to be. And I will tell you, I am not a fan of that feeling 
at all. Mm -mm -mm. Nope. But the more lost. <laughs> yeah. So the, the more we're willing to not know, the more willing we are to let go and surrender into the not knowing in this bizarre world of not having any markers, not having any milestones, not knowing if we're on track or not. Yeah. That's the soup. That's almost like the primordial soup that the early creatures sort of yeah. hurled themselves out yeah. of and onto the banks of the rivers. Um, that's, that's the thing that births life right there. That space, that sense of being so completely confused. And so what do we do when we have that feeling? Those of us who are yeah. a little bit leaning on that OCD. Yes. I was um, just going to say, because that's scary as hell, what you're describing. Um, oh, I'm like, awful. I feel it in the yeah. pit of my stomach. I'm like, it's awful. Oh, I don't like that. No milestones. It's so awful. <laughs> However, what, and we can build the musculature for it and I'll explain how to do that. Um, but so why it's so scary to us is that we believe, because again, culture has told us this and we've been rewarded for our behavior. We've been so handsomely rewarded for our controlling ways and our no nonsense demeanor and our get it done. Um, you can count on me, um, kind of thing. So, um, we, we don't willingly go into this space. However, um, if we let ourselves hang out there for just a little while, set a timer, even if it's just like putting you into, um, hyperventilation, set a timer for five minutes and hang out into not knowing for, for that long. Um, what's really interesting is, is that the prefrontal cortex part of us, the traffic cop part of us, clipboard Susie, <laughs> who's <laughs> just so much fun. Um, my trains run on time, right? But that's, there's no fun there. There's no joy there. There's no color there. There's no oxygen there. But if you let that part of you get a little lost, that's, and as you mentioned, you're in the shower, you're driving, you're hiking, whatever, but you can intentionally put yourself there too. Yeah. Then the back channels, what I call your creativity back channels, have a chance to speak to us and whisper these intuitive hits, yeah. these opportunities to see things in new ways. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, there is something to this business of letting ourselves get, yeah. get a little disoriented from our tried and true path, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a wonderful term in French, which, um, means to kind of stroll without purpose, which is flaneur. So if you're a, a woman, you're a flaneus. Um, so you, um, and I tried this when I went to Paris, um, after having not traveled for that two decade period, I let myself get lost on purpose. I didn't have an itinerary. I didn't have a map totally went against every bit of my, um, wanting to control and shape and experience, get the most out of my yeah, <laughs> trip exactly. to Paris. Yeah. So I just let myself get lost for an entire, like 10 days. Wow. Just walking the streets, seeing what was there, what, what was interesting to me, what, um, was in the windows, how, how did they plate their food? How did people, greet you at the hotel. What was happening there? Everything in that city is about design, art, intentionality, quality of life, spending time doing what you love with the people. It was everything that feeds the soul. Yeah. And everything in my life pivoted from that moment because I returned back to the shore of the way I was when I was five, essentially yeah. Yeah. the playful, silly. Um, I wonder what would happen if part of me all of a sudden got some new airtime and I started to pay attention to her again after having shushed her <laughs> for a long time because I didn't believe that what she had to say had any merit. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, she definitely does. She absolutely does. I mean, you've built, you built an entire business on it, my dear. So, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's so, it's so exactly, I think what happens is, and I always bring my kids up into this, but it's like, they remind you all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, I forgot. Like I could just laugh. Like last night I spent the evening. I could have kept working because God knows we all have enough work to do. Right. Like you said that inbox growing weeds and everything, but instead I spent the time laughing and tickling and just getting completely ridiculously silly with my six-year-old on the couch. And you know what? That lit me up a hell of a lot more than my inbox would have. And, oh, for sure. you know, sometimes those vacations, like I like, I like a good planned out vacation, like nobody's business, but, um, you know, I love the fact that you described that you just kind of wandered around and let the environment be the, the educator more so than you trying to force it through it. Absolutely. And I just recently, um, I was in, um, France in May and I had all of this stuff that I had to do for the book pre-launch. And, um, so I intentionally went to France with, and I wish I had it with me. Um, it's a one page <laughs> legal ripped off of a legal pad yeah. of Paris, um, Antibes, Provence, Nice, and X, X on Provence. Yeah. And I mapped out and all I was doing was figuring out, okay, I want to see Matisse. I want to see Cezanne. I want to see Van Gogh. I want to see, um, I want to go to Julia Child's um, former summer home in Provence and cook there. Um, so all I did, I mapped, the, the itinerary was not even really mapped. It was okay. just about art and beauty and food. Yeah. That was it. That was the only thing that I mapped out. Um. And I, I met people, I, you know, the, here's the other thing, when you live in that kind of a space, especially when you're in Europe, but it happens here in the United States too, you attract people yep. like crazy people want to hang out. They want to know who yeah. you are, what you're doing. Yep. Um, but we do, here's the thing. We send out those signals too, as entrepreneurs to the very people who need to hear our message the yes. most yep. when we're in that energetic state mm -hmm. of discovery. And I wonder what if, because now we're visible, right. we're vulnerable, and we're not coming from a place of preaching. Right. We're coming, <laughs> we're coming from a place of, um, and in, inviting into like, hanging out around a campfire yeah. of, of, of fun. And so that is, is such a, I, I encourage people, if you want to do so, want to start small, take a flaneuring walk around your neighborhood with no agenda, just notice shadows and lines and colors and people and building facades and whatever it is, or if you're out in the woods, just notice the, the beautiful natural setting that you're in and let yourself stop the, um, desire to have a certain kind of an experience, a premeditated, <laughs> a premeditated, joyful experience, yeah. like let all of that go. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it will arrive in your lap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is, that is take nothing else away from this right there, folks, is what she is like <laughs> the gold in this, right? Like if we just stop trying so hard to, to, like you said, premeditate joy, you know, like how many times have we tried to plan out the perfect occasion and then it went awry and it ended up being an amazing memory. We've been thinking in our family over here when things kind of go off the rails, we're like, we're making memories. <laughs> Look, you know, no matter what it is, right? Like making memories. We all yell it like at random times when things are going crazy, but because that's what it is, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to look a certain way or be a certain way. And, you know, I love the giving up control on that. Well, we could talk about this for hours because I think it's absolutely beautiful, <laughs> but, but I want people to know where to find you, especially, sure. you know, get the book, all of that good stuff. So tell people more about where they can get in touch with you. Oh, thank you. Um, so my website is innovation and creativity institute.com. 
And you can get to all of my um, social channels through that one particular site. Wonderful. You can also sign up for my weekly newsletter there, which is, of course, free. Um, and it's an opportunity to kind of go into the weekend with a little bit of a new perspective and a new um, stretch of the mind. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would love for people to sign up there. Um, I also would love for people to have a look at my book, Buoyant, yeah. um, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Becoming Wildly Successful, Creative and Free, which I did write for that stuck entrepreneur who's riddled with self-doubt, who believes that that path forward is through more productivity and more discipline. And they don't know that it's through tapping into your innate creativity. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, it is a combination of exercises. So there's, there's opportunities for you to do things. So you're not, I'm not just giving you sort of how to's, right. but I'm guiding you through the things that I did to pull myself out of the quicksand. Nice. And I can tell you they're fun. You can dip in and out of the book as you wish. Um, you don't have to start on page one and go to the end. You can kind of just sort of see what calls to you. I will say um, from the people who are giving me feedback, uh, chapters two and four are the ones that people are saying um, really helped launch them out of their yeah. sense of feeling like they're in exile. Yeah. Um, so that's um uh, a place where you might start if you're not a, if you're not a beginning to the end kind of a reader. <laughs> nice, nice. I I love that because I think also like if if you're anything like me, I read like five books at once. So yes. and I think a lot of us <laughs> entrepreneurs are always kind of like reaching for different books and you know taking in different information. So that is fantastic. Well, Susie, thank you so much, so much for this conversation. I've absolutely loved it. It has been an absolute delight. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you. And there's really not, not much more that's um, closer to my heart than speaking to resilient entrepreneurs. So I really appreciate <laughs> the opportunity. Of course, of course. <laughs>